My name is Amber Stanford, and I'm a junior in the Georgetown College studying government theology. I've been involved with geopolitics for the past two years and previously served on a student leadership council. Today, I am excited to introduce Governor Bullock. Steve Bullock, Montana's former attorney general, was elected Montana's 24th governor in 2012. A native Montanan, Governor Bullock was born in Missoula and raised in Helena. He attended public schools in Helena and graduated from Helena High School in 1984. He received his undergraduate degree from Claremont McKenna College and his law degree with honors from Columbia University Law School in New York. Please join me in welcoming Governor Bullock to the stage. Okay. Okay, hold, on. hold on. Hold on. All right, there he is. To fix that. Thanks, Amber. Yeah. Hey. Governor, good to see you. Well, it's great seeing you as well. Governor Bullock always has those boots, or some boots. Uh, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a tie. You, for you today, I Allie, for the that. students, I'm wearing a tie. I appreciate that. I, I, until somebody tweets us and tells us that somehow it's environmentally unfriendly, which we may learn. <laughs> uh, but thank you for being here, sir. No, thank I you for doing it. I appreciate it. Uh, one of the things we're talking about today is the energy in this topic, the idea that people many young people have really driven this conversation, right? Many, many people our age who have kids are influenced by, by their kids' thinking or the thinking of young people. And across the world today, uh, young people and others are taking to the streets to, to sort bet. of ratchet up the heat, if you will, on this topic. Later on, I'm going to be talking to Governor Bill Weld. We keep saying these are all Democratic candidates, but in fact, we invited everybody who was running for president, yeah. and Bill Weld took us up on it. And I'm, I, I, I'm really happy he did, because these conversations are not complete without Republicans. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. So I want to talk to you about that in your state, because your, your state, in public opinion polls, is split about 50-50 uh, on whether climate change is caused by human activity. That's according to Yale University. And, and that's about uh, seven points lower than the national average, yeah. uh, you, you know, about what people think in the country. Tell me about how you address that in a place like Montana, because you and I have talked about the fact that ranchers and, and farmers and agricultural people do understand that something is changing. What's the issue? Yeah, and I think, I mean, in Montana, we're outdoors people, right? We see it every day. Yep. Our fire seasons are 78 days longer than they were a few decades ago. Or farmers and ranchers are actually, their planting seasons are changing. I had to close down the Yellowstone River uh, in the fall of 2016, right before I was up for re-election, mm -hmm. because of fish kills. So folks see what's happening there. But then we also have to, like, we have to recognize, like, the first George Bush, George H.W. Uh -huh. Bush, right, said, we're going to address the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. I mean, here was a Republican president as a leader right. saying we're going to do this. Now the Republican Party is the only major political party in the world that doesn't acknowledge the science that climate change is human caused. So part of this is, I, and I think it's also the corrupting money in our system, but what we've seen time and time again is these counter narratives. Uh -huh. We can't wait another 30 or 40 years. So we have to make it not only is it a climate crisis, but it's also a climate opportunity. It's an opportunity for the people protesting all across this world right now, but it's also an opportunity to actually create good jobs and create even a better future for this generation. So how do you see that happening? What does, well, and before I get that, get to that, let me ask you, how, can you remember when this went from something you believed was true into something that you believed was urgent? Well, I think that, <clears throat> It's been something that we've all, at least for the last number of decades, believed it was true. And that was my point about the first President Bush. Right. He said it right. was Ronald true. Ronald Reagan understood it. Even Newt Richard Gingrich Nixon talked about it back realized then, Realized right? it was a thing. And I think the urgency is when the scientists, like when the IPCC comes out and says, we have to be carbon neutral as a world by 2050. Mm -hmm. We see it every day, you know, we have Glacier National Park in Montana. The glaciers are a lot different today than they were when I was growing up as a kid there. We see it every day, but now it's also the scientists have put the parameters around it. If we don't reverse this course, we know exactly what's gonna happen. Does it matter to you that a, a, a large percentage of people in your state believe climate change is true, obviously. They're a very small percentage of climate deniers. But the issue about whether it's uh, caused by humankind or not, is that relevant in your discussion with people in Montana? Well, I think it's, 
it's relevant in as much as you got to recognize as we're making these moves and these transitions and we have to take immediate and durable action not action that will just get reversed as we've seen by this administration you know the minute uh, a new administration comes right. in but it is relevant in as much as that you can't necessarily you can try to change people's opinions but you can also recognize that look you're not a scientist we don't have the margin of error here mm -hmm. to be debating the possibilities of not taking action and to be able to say, here's what action can mean for your community. So just a positive thing along the way. So uh, something that it may not be clear to everybody because your state doesn't get mentioned in the conversations that constantly happen about uh, coal workers in this country, but you have coal workers. No, sure. Uh, and, and you have fewer coal workers uh, than you've ever had before. Uh, so there's, that is always a, a blueprint for either how we're gonna deal with this in the future with energy workers or we're not, because there are a lot of coal communities and coal workers who would say, we haven't handled this well. So what do you do for displaced workers? What does, uh, what does a Bullock presidency look like for people who say, hold on a second, no, sure. my life is prosperous yeah. because of fossil fuels? And, and that's one of the things that as we move this transition, we have to be you know, an immediate durable and a fast transition. We can't be leaving communities behind. Right. I think so often, often when Democrats are talking about everything that we have to do, to your point, you have people that have spent their whole lives powering this country. Right. And sometimes they're viewed like they must be part of the problem. Like we have a coal plant that will be closing down by the end of this year in Montana. And we got about $5.6 million of grants to work on that transition, to make sure that people can turn around and say, you know, there will be additional opportunities mm -hmm. for those same plant closures I actually passed through uh, my legislature a bill that said when we look at cleaning up the messes of yesterday the restoration economy well we're going to pay a prevailing wage we're going to actually first hire people that might have been you know had the skills working at that same coal plant and i think we need to really as we address this we cannot leave communities behind we have to have robust investments in those communities if we're ever going to fully transform. So as a governor, you've seen the effects that uh, that occur in communities where there are transitions. We are, you and I have talked about this before, we're in a period of transition. Even if climate wasn't a priority, we're transitioning to a world with more artificial intelligence, with more robotics uh, that uses less human labor. So we're in some shift already. Uh, how do you see us folding climate, uh, combating climate change into that shift and how do you see that playing out in communities? How, how does that actually look in a, in a given Montana community or a given American how community? How does the impact you want to of climate generally? No, what, or? What, how does the transition into uh, a climate fighting environment look? What, what changes for Americans and American cities? Well, I think hopefully what happens along the way is we see opportunity, right? That federal government has been able to get an infrastructure bill through a significant one in years and years. Right. Well, if we do a climate infrastructure bill, it's just but one example. It creates job opportunities all the way along. We have to look at what we can do in investing. In, you know, it's always been the ingenuity. John Maynard, do we have any economics majors? John Maynard uh, Keynes. Put your hand proud, economics yeah. people. <laughs> Whole long time ago, decades ago, I think in the 30s, Keynes said, you know, boy, we're gonna have massive displacement mm -hmm. due to all this technology. Well, every other time, as a nation, we've grown, we've gotten better. So we have to say we can unleash American ingenuity to create jobs, to invest in new ways. There's been more technological changes in our phones in the last decade than pretty much how we generate energy. And we can actually create jobs along the way. It's not all about sacrifice. So what does that look like uh, for a President Bullock who may not have a Democratic Senate? Well, I think that's one of the things that we have to actually recognize that this can't be just a partisan issue. So why do you think it is? Well, I think it is because of the Koch brothers, oil companies, the corrupting influence of money in our system. Like if you think about it, when a George Bush or a Ronald Reagan or a Newt Gingrich, you say climate change is real. And now you have a point, this case, Citizens United, that made corporations into people and money into speech. If you look at it, even since then, before that case, 2% of all outside spending was from groups that don't disclose their donors. This midterm elections, it was over half. 
So the corrupting influence of money in the system, and it's not just about climate. It's about gun safety. It's about income inequality. It's about prescription drug prices. So much right, of it's this. All the, it's all a similar model of corrupting influence. Yeah, right? it's, all it's of these issues that we doubt. talk about in part mm -hmm. are as a result, at least in part, as a result of sort of how the incentives and the dark money has gone into our system. But I think what we need to do is turn it into. It's one of the things, you know, like, look, when 44% of Americans were now 400 bucks in their pocket mm -hmm. in case of emergency. When you are thinking about how do I make it to the end of the month, it's hard to worry every day about, well, we're about to get to the point of the end of the world if we don't mm -hmm. take action. Right, but that's a very good way of saying it because if you're worried about the end of the month or the end of the year, the end of the world seems further away. Yeah, it's a lot harder to care yeah. about if you don't know how you're going to pay off your car bill or your mm -hmm. medical bill along the way. So, but I think how we take it outside of, DC's become a place of inaction, absolute inaction. And how I've been able to move things in Montana with legislatures that's between 60% and at times two thirds Republican, is you don't just make your case here in DC. You know, the next president, if it's still Republican controlled Senate, should spend as much time in Kentucky mm -hmm. as he or she does in DC. Because once folks turn around and say, We've got to take action, <clears throat> be it on climate, be it on other issues. And it's those individuals that are speaking to their elected representatives. I think you can make meaningful change. Another thing that I think that we should look at in a general perspective is I'd love to see for every elected representative that comes to Washington, D.C., for at least half the time they're in office, they can't be running for office mm. again. So in Montana's example, I get re-elected governor or elected governor, I have to shut down my campaign account. Why not make it a U.S. senator gets elected for the first three years mm -hmm. that he or she's in office, they can't be raising money for that next campaign. They actually have to be talking to their constituents mm -hmm. and doing the work that we expect of them. In Montana, once I'm done with the campaign, I actually have to give all the money that I've left over to charities or other things. Why allow just the continual begging, basically, for dollars? Because I think that squeezes everybody else's voices mm -hmm. out along the way. Because the fossil fuel companies have a lot of that money, and they have, there's increasing and mounting evidence that they had lots of data that indicated, and they acknowledged that the work they were involved in was yeah. going to be damaging to the environment and, and to the earth. So there, is a, there are mixed sentiments about how a climate president should involve them in the solution. There are some who say they should be held to account, possibly punished for the contribution that they have made to this and, and fined and, you know, that it should be treated like the opioid crisis. And there are others who say they might be at the forefront of the new way we look at energy. How do you see it? Well, I think that certainly there has to be some accountability along the way, but it really is unleashing the American ingenuity to find that next step. You know, it was years ago that BP, one of the oil companies, initially for a while had branded themselves beyond petroleum, beyond petroleum yeah. saying that we yeah. have to start taking those actions along the way. And I think that the same has to be true for all of them. Look, we have a tax structure where Many of these major oil companies paid zero in taxes last year on the Trump tax cuts. Whoever cleans up after us tonight in this room actually paid more than 60 Fortune 500 companies. We have tax credits and giveaways that are going to the petroleum companies. That has to stop. But we also have to, the federal government has to be a partner in incentivizing opportunities to actually get new technologies. And I think that even Oil companies and everybody else can be part of those solutions along the way. What does is, what is the federal government take having a part in incentivizing big solutions look like to you? Because the things that a lot of uh, climate experts write about that we're going to need is not just our changes in consumption behavior and uh, things around the edges. It's going to be big industrial level stuff. Well, and I think that's right. I, I mean, and there are steps that the next president can take all alone, right? Rejoining Paris day one. Day two, not even the auto industry wanted to get rid of these Correct. fuel efficiency yep. standards. Day three, I'd turn around and make my whole executive branch Every single agency say, what are you going to do to address climate? Would make my Department of Agriculture and Department of Interior say, on all of our federal lands, I want to plan by 2030, we are net zero emissions. 
and you can do those pieces. That's the first three days, and you would really have to roll up your sleeves because right. the federal because the hard work does come afterwards. Yeah, and the hard this work is low hanging fruit you're talking about. The hard work comes afterwards, in as much as some of it shouldn't be that hard, like an infrastructure bill. But investing at the federal level as a partner in technology, like we can talk about agriculture, mm -hmm. the dairy uh, industry will have reduced their emissions from 2010 to 2020 levels by 25% on their own. The federal government has a role to be investing both in private industry and others to say, how do we get that next technological breakthrough? Mm -hmm. And we have to do it in a way you, it's kind of, it's fitting that we're Georgetown. It was like 2013 when Barack Obama gave this incredible speech about climate. And it's worth reading again about what we have to do for today and for the next oh. generation. And he already talked about some of the gains that have been made along the way. Well, what we've seen is so many of those gains are being immediately right. rolled back. Right. So it can't just be, we can't address this by one individual and by executive order alone. We have to get both community, Republican Party, everyone's buy-in to say that any other great challenge this country's faced We've actually rolled up our sleeves and we found that way. And we can do that. So when you look at uh, the rollbacks of the California emission standards that, that we talked about, they've been in place for almost five decades, right? This is, and the auto companies built cars to that standard, which made cars better for everybody yeah. as a result. Now, people have been uh, saying in the last couple of days, why don't the automakers just do the right thing and keep those standards regardless of what the fed federal government did? But someone will come and undercut that, right? There'll be somebody perhaps not an American automaker, who will say, the standards are not that high. I don't have to manufacture cars at that standard in order to sell them. So the, the federal government does have to set these higher standards, or at least enforce higher standards. Well, and the absurdity is you could look at water, you could look at emissions, you could look at everything, and it's always been that the federal government sets a baseline right. and states can actually do better. Right. I mean, our water standards in Montana are better than they were under any previous administration at the federal level. That's this idea of federalism. But this sort of wholesale attack by this administration on addressing climate, on trying to take away, as you say, five decades where the auto industry is bought in. Right. It's an absurdity in as much as, I mean, we have to do a lot for climate. The best thing we can do and the first thing we could do is replace Donald Trump. Let's talk about uh, agriculture, something you know a lot about. Uh, and people don't often think of, although scientists and, and, and candidates who have been here do bring it up, that somewhere between a fifth and 23 percent of our emissions are from agriculture in this country. Uh, how do you think about that, and is that a more difficult sell to some of your constituents than technology and oil processing? Well, I think in as much as if what we s figure the solution is well, how we're going to take care of climate is no one can ever eat beef again. Um, I think at that point, yes, it is. But I think here's another one of these where if the federal government's investing, we can look at this as an opportunity. And I'll give you two different examples, one of which is in cattle production. UC Davis has been doing some work mm -hmm. that said, you know, just adding even some seaweed to cattle feed can reduce emissions by 60%. Well, that's another area where the federal government, this president doesn't really believe in science, but investing in figuring out those ways along the way. Another is that from no-till farming or cover crops, mm -hmm. as an example, um, you know, we have this CRP program, it's Conservation Reserve Program. So we've always paid farmers some money not to be planting. But it's always been viewed more as a price stabilization, right? We're taking right. land out to increase prices. We should be incentivizing farmers and producers. Actually, we'll pay them to have better practices mm -hmm. that are less greenhouse gas or carbon intensive along the way. Because our ag producers, our forests, everything could be an incredible capture right. of carbon. And I think that's the way that we need to look at that. So forward. not limiting produc production, but enhancing better production Absolutely. of a higher quality that contributes to biodiversity Absolutely. and the capture of Absolutely. carbon. Because in the farmers, are, like you could go to, I don't know if you've spent much time in Iowa lately, go to like Pacific Junction, go to so many places where the flooding is so substantially yep. impacted. Go to a state like Montana where 
John Tester, our senior senator, is, I think, the only actual daily farmer in the Senate. And he says, my planning seasons have changed. The impact on our ag community is significant. The contributions our ag community can make to addressing climate are mm -hmm. significant as well. So where is the, where is the fracture in farmers who in many cases are Democrat, but a lot of cases are Republican, people who work in agriculture, who see this outdoors people who are maybe conservatives and maybe the part of conservative in their thinking is conserving the earth. Where is this fracture? Why is it amongst uh, a number of conservatives, this denial or, or some version of not liking the science is so strong? Because it, it seems obvious to me from your examples that it shouldn't be. Well, I, I don't think it should be either. And that's where, I mean, that's where we all have to ask ourselves what's changed in the last couple decades? Mm -hmm. What's made it so as we get more and more to the point where we have to take immediate right, action? Right, the situation has gotten worse. Yeah. And the, and the and acceptance the, has gotten less. Yeah. And that's the only direct attribution that I can make is the corrupting influence but, but of money in our system. But a guy like you can't go out there and call people who don't, believe the science Luddites or whatever. You can't call them names, you can't, you can't berate them. Uh, you got to have the conversation and we're running out of time for that conversation. So the argument for a Steve Bullock presidency is I deal with this. I've got people in my constituency uh, who, who deal with these issues, who are conservatives. What, how do you approach that? How I, do you deal with people who don't register the science? And I have been in communities, like in coal-related communities, right. where we said that we have to figure out a transition along the way. And folks is, you know, rightfully so. They're saying, look, you always liked my power before. Right. So I think part of it is partnering in that. But it's also, as an example, especially throughout the West, public lands, mm -hmm. we all own them. The Federal Republican Party has always had as one of its platforms to transfer these lands away from mm -hmm. federal ownership, sometimes states privatizing. That issue alone in the West has made folks that might not think of themselves as conservationists or environmentalists. Right all of a sudden much more bought in because they know that we all own them equally, we can all utilize them. So I think that the way that you address it is directly, not the abstract of what happens at 2050, mm -hmm. A, what you're seeing every day on the ground when a Yellowstone River has to be shut right. down or when a community is told they shouldn't be there for the whole summer because of a record fire season that I had two years ago. Mm -hmm. And say from that perspective, but also say what the opportunities can be for us along the way. Right. And you might not believe in all of the science that the, what, 99% right, of but scientists say. Evidence is sometimes say. science, right? Yeah. If, you're, if you're, as you said, you and I have discussed this before, places like Montana are where the left and the right can actually come together because the goal is the same. Preserve this land, preserve this water, preserve this wildlife. And once you get outside of the politics, like I truly right. believe most people's lives, and that's how I've been able to make advancements in Montana, is the values people share are the same. Right. Everybody wants a decent job, a safe community, roof over their head, clean air, clean water good schools and the belief you can do better for that next generation mm -hmm. than yourself. So as we say that we share the values even across political parties, what we should be talking about is those values and how we can make this transition. So you'll still have a good job. We will have guaranteed clean air and clean water, not just for today, but for the future. And how you can make sure that that next generation, because economically, right, if you're 30 years old right now, half of 30 year olds are doing better than their parents were at age 30. When I was growing up, it was 90%. So economically, there are significant challenges along the way. We need to be able to build all of this in a way that folks say that we can address climate change. We have to address climate change. We can't wait again, but we can actually create greater opportunity, not less. And that's what we've always been able to do in this country. Uh, one of the things that we were just talking about before you came on was what's going on in, in, around the world today uh, in Germany. 100 thousand students out there, 100,000, not all students, 100,000 people uh, motivated in many cases by young people. This is not only not just an American problem, uh, we're, yeah. we're far behind the curve compared to most countries. However, we also have China. We are on one level, they're not climate deniers, but they are exporting a lot of coal factories and coal uh, to uh, other parts of the world. China is not the 
bright shining example some would have it be. They do understand that they need more energy and they do understand pollution. But we're not in a leadership role with anybody right now. How do you change that? Well, and that's pulling out of Paris. I mean, why is it that half of the states, mine included, said we're going to meet Paris even if the federal government rolls back? And we cannot solve this issue alone. Yeah, China admits twice as much CO2 each year as the U.S. does. But also recognize China holds more patents for renewable technology mm -hmm. right. there are than both the sides U.S. Of this does. Issue. And that's in part where the federal government has to step up right. and say we have a significant role to play so tell in me this. what that looks like to you, because China has decided many of these technologies are run by what you might call private companies, but they're not really, because in China that doesn't exist the same way. They are government sponsored and supported efforts to understand the best technology in climate friendly energy production. We don't do that enough in the United States. But we've always previously at yeah. least believed in both science and investing in technology places and that there might yeah. be market failures. And yeah. that's where I think the federal government has to, and that's everywhere from agriculture to battery storage, has to be a partner in this with federal dollars to help take that along to move this stuff along. Is because there a, is there a, a, does every department in your administration sort of have to do this or is there some coordinating body or do you, you've mentioned interior, you've mentioned agriculture, there's energy, there's EPA. How does it look like to you structurally? I think it looks like, first of all, and that was my, I guess, day three is saying to every single agency, right. what are you going to do not only to reduce your own footprint, but to help feed that innovation? Mm -hmm. A Department of Transportation, you know, there's been a lot of studies about how new concrete could actually be a carbon sink. Mm -hmm. A Department of Transportation, which deals with the highway bill, needs to have a role in this. The Department of Agriculture, when we look at a farm bill and what we can do for forest restoration, has to have a part of this. The military has to have a part of it. So I really think it is a challenge within that first week to every single one of your agencies to say, what are you going to do to address this? Because all of us have that obligation. One of the things in the West that, uh, you know, it depends where you are in this country or what your personal experience is. You mentioned flooding in, in uh, the plains. Uh, I've just come back from coverage of the hurricane, uh, of Dorian. There's flooding in Texas right now. But there are remarkable wildfires at a rate that we have no, never yeah. be seen. I mean, remarkable wildfires. And again, it's one of those things that people used to say, this isn't the time to talk about climate. Now you're just an idiot not to talk about climate <laughs> when you see all these wildfires and these hurricanes and this flooding. You've got to understand the climate. No, that's right. Well, and, and think about it. In the West, fire seasons are literally 78 days right. longer than they were three and four decades ago. Uh, I had my worst fire season two years ago. People say, well, what's the sacrifice? What sacrifice are we asking people to right. make when we address climate? 17,000 houses right. were lost in California right. last year. Right, so it's no, it's no sacrifice, so the sacrifice to fix that. Yeah. yeah, the sacrifice is there, but that's also another one of those things where, and we finally fixed it to a degree, uh, the Forest Service used to deal with what we'd call as fire borrowing, right? Mm -hmm. So what you do is the Forest Service budget, they'd be given a budget every mm -hmm. year, and no matter how much you had to spend on fires, you do that, and then the money to actually do restoration work, protecting watersheds, less and less was sort of left over at the end. Mm -hmm. It was Democrats and Republicans, many of them through the Western Governor Association that came together and said, we need to start treating fires more like we treat other natural disasters right. and in this practice of fire borrowing. And I think those are some of the things along the way to both build the resiliency and do the investments on the federal level, not on the back end after the crisis has occurred, but on the front right. end to prevent the crisis that can make a meaningful difference. Because you know as a governor what everybody, every economist knows and everybody in finance knows and every insurance company knows that money at the front end when, when building, when deciding on how to manage these things is far more effective uh, and far smaller than money on the other end when you're fighting a fire, when you're rebuilding a, a town destroyed by a hurricane or a fire or, or a flood. And, and that's exactly the same as we address climate. I mean, investments that we're going to make today, I mean, we know our runway, right? right? We know our runway is by 2050 at the latest. 
I've said that as a country, we should be net zero emissions by 2040 or even before. Mm -hmm. And if we launch that ingenuity, we can get there. But we know that those investments, just like dealing with fires, on the front end are going to have that payoff for the next generations or the next decades as well. And that's where we need to start going to. I was speaking to Julian Castro yesterday about how we think about cars and vehicles because he's from Texas and they like their trucks. And you guys in Montana like your trucks too. Uh, how do you think about transportation and the way people have to think of driving and consumption and vehicles well and i think again here's an opportunity right so we know about 37 percent of emissions are dealing with yeah. transportation i have a 1984 chevy pickup that i don't think that the answer is to get rid of every pickup along the way but democrat and republican governors seven of us throughout the western states have said let's work together to make sure that there's electric fueling stations so you could travel all throughout the West to recognize these opportunities. And what this administration is doing where the auto industry doesn't even want to look at this is so problematic mm -hmm. in as much as let's allow the auto industry to com continue to actually innovate. Which and done. we have I to mean, find look, public transportation. Ford too. with their F-Series trucks, they did it, right? They made a lighter truck with a smaller engine that didn't affect the driver's sense of output or power or And we've done that truck. time yeah. and time again. And that's what we'll get to with electric vehicles right. as long as the base infrastructure the market is can there figure as out. well. The market can figure out what your needs and, and, and joys are. And figure out some way to meet it, but we're standing in the way of that at the moment. We are now actually trying to prevent the market right. from doing that as opposed to incentivizing the market yeah. to make these changes. Let's uh, go out to the students. I want to go to uh, Iowa State University. Go ahead. The students, I want to go. Hi, I'm Cassie Bond at Iowa State University. I'm majoring in agriculture and political science. Uh, my question for you today is agriculture is one of the biggest industries that's going to be affected by climate change. What plans do you have to not only help the agriculture industry but also protect it um, in the upcoming years in regards to climate change? Yeah, and thank you for the question, Cassie, because it really is a lot of what Iowa's heritage is. It's what Montana's heritage is, but more than just our heritage, right? We feed the country and we feed the world. And that's where I think that ag can be a meaningful partner in this. You look at, and I've talked to farmers in Iowa who are saying, planting cover crops not only helps with your water quality, but it also, at the end of the day, helps with preserving their land. At the federal government, we need to be incentivizing those opportunities, working with his, the best conservationists, the best environmentalists in some respects, are people that have had a generation a hundred year old farm and they want to pass that on to that next generation. So I think that w in a Bullock administration, we'd stop looking at like our payments to farmers not to produce as just a price support. We'd look at it as we're going to better incentivize good practices for land stewardship because that will also capture the carbon along the way. Then I think we do have to, it's actually uh, your former governor, Secretary Vilsack, who heads the Dairy Council right mm -hmm. now, right? And they've reduced in the last decade the carbon emissions from dairy by 20%. They'll cut it down by 20, I think 25% a quarter, just from 2010 to 2020. The federal government has to be a partner in furthering that, in the research and investing in that along with the ag producers. That way we'll not only be able to maintain your way of life, we'll not only be able to maintain producing the finest goods in an Iowa or Montana, but then we'll also address carbon. And I think it has to be a partnership for sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, and so that I don't cause you a back injury, I'm going to put the next oh, one. Oh, look there. at that. Um, well, let's go to the University of Southern California. Go ahead. Um, well, let's go to the University of Southern California. Go ahead. Good morning, Governor. My name is Andrew Binder, and I'm a sophomore studying philosophy here at USC. Later today, I'll join the global climate strike with young people around the world in calling for action to finally confront the climate crisis. One of the most important issues to me and many people my age is finally holding the fossil fuel companies accountable who've known about climate change for decades but still chose to put profits ahead of the planet. So my question to you is what actions have you taken as governor 
that show we can trust you as president to finally hold these companies accountable. Thanks for the question. Thanks for waking up early this yeah. morning, for sure. You know, we have tried to hold time and time again corporate polluters accountable in the state of Montana. One would be a group that uh, had poisoned many of our waters, a company uh, that came back and wanted to have yet, and it's called our bad actor law, had many of the same people then leading other mines. We said, absolutely not. I think we do have to take, look, all of us, not only the oil companies, right? If we were gonna hold everybody accountable for not taking action in climate, you'd have to hold half of the people here in Washington DC accountable who's known about this and not done a darn thing along the way. So from that perspective, I think that, I'm not gonna say that we should spend all of our time saying here's what happened in the past, but here's what we ought to be doing in the future. And we can't be further incentivizing the opportunities for individuals or companies to be basically not addressing climate. When even private industry, some of them outside of fossil fuel companies, are saying, we now have an obligation and we're going to meet that obligation. I think that's where we can really look at it, not just looking backwards, but forwards is that better opportunity. Thank you, sir. Let's go to the floor. Good morning, Governor Bullock. Uh, my name is Christopher Hatzel. I'm a junior in the college studying government and American studies with a minor in economics. So about seven years ago, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I need to clear my throat here. Uh, about seven years ago, Hurricane Sandy struck my hometown in Massapequa, New York. Yeah. And uh, since then, destructive storms have only grown more common. So how do Bullock administration ensure that communities rebuild not just to repair the damaged infrastructure around them, but also to increase the resilience and sustainability of, of those communities. Yeah, and thank you, because we see that time and time again in Montana as well, right? Record flooding seasons and record f fire seasons. And what happens under the current model is that FEMA will help pay once you've dealt with the disaster. Uh -huh. They pay for some stuff to deal with resiliency thereafter. But we also, as we address climate change, we have to address climate resiliency up front, right? We have to be able to deal with our watersheds. We have to be able to deal with communities. And I think that is in part where the federal government can make a more sustained investment in saying, what are the challenges of disasters that are going to occur? And that's not to take away from the need to take immediate action to make sure that we don't have that future disaster, meaning that we have to actually address climate, but we have to build resiliency along the way, and that's every single agency, state, and federal partnerships that do so, because the way we do it right now is exactly what happened in your community. After the disaster, we deal with it. We're not investing up front to mitigate the impacts of that disaster. We, uh, when you talk to the student at Iowa State, you, know, you talked about being able to maintain a way of life, and I, I wonder how you think about this, because we've talked about trucks and we've talked about eating beef, but a lot of people in our country live in floodplains, they live in coastal cities. They have, in a very American way, although the whole world, world has done this, decided that we can conquer nature, right? We can live on places that naturally probably should be underwater and are going to be underwater at certain times. What role does the federal government have in disincentivizing or incentivizing people to move or to not build up Houston so that it floods every year. Yeah. What do we, do? how do we think about this? Because you come from a place where people like their rights and they like their land and they're not really all that interested in the federal government getting up in their grill. Well, <laughs> I also, yeah, and I also come from a place where sort of like the wildland urban interface is there, right? More right. and more people are building. Right into the woods and the and challenge that's a problem, along, because we take trees down and we put concrete yeah and, and the challenge of that along the way i think that first of all i mean first and foremost as opposed to saying we should basically relocate everybody in a floodplain what we need to do is say what can we do to address so that hundred year flood is only going to be every hundred years not every 10 years right so that is the addressing of the climate parts of it but i think as far as the federal government has a limited role in telling people what the city of Houston can do. Mm -hmm. or The city of Houston won't even tell people what yeah, people in yeah, Houston can do. Where you can build, but we also have the ability to incentivize people to do right. Incentivize people to do right, and like we even use state dollars if you're gonna be in a wildland urban interface. This isn't about 
paving everything, but it's about making sure that you have safe and defensible spaces mm -hmm. so that a fire is less apt to go through the 17,000 Would you be inclined, kill. though, to be involved in a discussion that says maybe we need to think about how we settle places and maybe we shouldn't be encouraging places? You know, there are, if the worst of this comes through, there are going to be places in America that will be underwater. Yeah. And, and the challenge, I think we should have that conversation, Allie. The challenge is that most of those places are already settled, right? Yep. So Heavily settled. So, so, so the notion of just relocation, you have to do the resiliency stuff to do as much protective work as mm -hmm. you can. But when we talk about here are places that will be underwater in 50 years, maybe we should be saying, let's do everything we can right now to make sure those places won't be underwater in 50 years because this planet can't wait any longer. Right. Go ahead. Hi, Governor Bullock. My name is Kiernan Christ, and I'm a sophomore in the SFS, the School of Foreign Service, studying international politics. My question is, climate crises and natural disasters will create a growing number of climate refugees fleeing instability and poverty caused by climate change. What will your policy be with regards to these refugees, and how will you help them both domestically and internationally? Well, thank you for the question, and thanks for the good work that you're doing. Like we're even seeing right now, on a smaller level, right? The Bahamas get wiped out and Governor DeSantis says, we don't have room for these folks right now. I mean, it's incredibly problematic when you're losing your home or your community that you're not going to do anything. First the international and then the domestic because, and that was part of our earlier discussion, the U.S. cannot solve this alone, right? We know that we have to take about a billion tons of CO2 out every single year. And I think that the, America has always played a leading role when we look at some of the biggest challenges our world has faced. And right now, we're completely on the sidelines. And America first, under this administration, has become America alone, not just on climate, but on foreign policy and so much else. So retaining that global leadership role and knowing that as the greatest country in the world, we have to invest and we have to get our partners to invest. The rainforests in Brazil are so, so important. We need to be not just our country, but all of us saying, when you look at overall climate protection, here's where we can actually work with Brazil to try to preserve this, knowing that we can't tell Brazil everything that they must do. And just as we've dealt with humanitarian aid and opportunity around this world, we also have to address climate aid and opportunity. When it comes to the displacement of people along the way, and when we look at climate refugees, I think first and foremost, again, what we all have to solve today is how we're not going to have climate refugees in 2050. And we have to take that immediate, durable, and lasting action, lasting action so it won't be reversed immediately thereafter. But then, Let's say that we don't get there. I think that there has to be both an aid package and when you look at at least immigration policies, saying where can we be more welcoming to places that have been displaced? You know, it's an interesting, uh, Chris Hayes was saying yesterday that whether you agree with President Trump's approach on, to immigration, he, has, he promised he would do something about it and he has thrown every tool, legal or otherwise, at dealing with it. And there are wow. some who say, interesting approach to climate. I mean, most people in this country do not think uh, immigration is the emergency that President Trump does, but more people think climate's an emergency. What's the parallel there? Yeah, I, I think the challenge on that really is, and there is a whole bunch you can do by executive order. But I could give you, I think it's about 85 different environmental regulations and practices that this administration came in and immediately reversed. Right. So you can just, that's, and that's the easy I, stuff. As somebody from the West, though, like, look, shrinking our national monuments, selling off our public lands, once that happens, you're never going to be able to fix it. So I don't, I think the next president should take some executive action. But my problem is, if that's what we rely on, because this is what, right, Trump's done. This is what, unfortunately, because of obstinate Congress, Obama, President Obama had to do in mm -hmm. part, then we're not going to get to the lasting solution. We can't have this whiplash. We know that what we have to do over the next several decades. 
So I think executive action has to be a part of it, but we have to sell this to the greater world mm -hmm. about what the opportunity is if we're going to make that lasting and systemic so change. So what then makes you the guy for these people to vote for on this topic? Well, well, I think that what makes me the guy to vote on that topic is that you know, being outside of Washington, D.C., being a governor where you actually have to work with people and get things done, I bring a different perspective. I mean, when I look at what we've been able to do both for our environment and stopping um, environmental degradation, okay. when I look at doubling wind, quadrupling solar in Montana just in the last handful of years, I've known that I can't do all of this just by myself. And we've got to get to this, the only one in this field that actually won in a state where Donald Trump won. Right, that he took Montana by 20 points. I won by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. Not because they agreed with everything that I did, but I tried to find some commonality to move our state forward. We need to get to that point, this point in Washington, D.C. We need to be able to make this not just a young person's issue, not just a Democratic Party issue, not just a conservationist's issue, but an issue that we see the opportunity for everybody. And as the, I think the only one, well, the only governor left, the only one that's actually been able to bridge divides to get things done, I think I bring something to that for sure. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sheridan Buff from the college here at Georgetown. So as you may or may not be aware, you are the only governor in this, in this race now and the only candidate to have won in a Trump state. That's great. Considering that addressing the huge problem of climate change will require a president who can win more than just a slim majority, those, uh, those credentials of yours are uniquely appealing. Yet, surely you cannot deny that all your prior electoral and governing successes have come in the specific context of Montana. As you go to a, a national campaign, how can you hope to maintain the support of coal miners in Montana while promising to bring progressive climate action to the White House? And how could you win the support of Republican, uh, Republicans in Congress where it's hyper-partisan, -par yeah due to national media and due to special interests. Yeah, and, and thanks for the question, Jared. Yeah, some people, the, just that small population state somewhere in the West, you know, bigger population than states like Delaware or Vermont, so we do okay in that respect. Um, but oh, snap. <laughs> directly to the point of a couple different areas, one of which is when we talk about who can be substantially impacted as we take immediate and aggressive action. That's part of my point is not just we as Democrats, but we as a country can't be leaving communities behind. We have to actually, where there is gonna be significant transition in a community as we transition to renewables, we have to, as a federal government and as state governments, have to be making the partnership every single step of the way to say that you can see a better opportunity and we'll invest in you along the way. But I think to your greater point, too, is are we at a point in Washington, D.C. where nothing can ever work again? And it'll just be the Democrats and it'll be the Republicans. And if we switch back and forth, um, everything will get reversed. If so, we're handing off a pretty sad state of affairs for your generation. If this is what this 243-year experiment in representative democracy has become. Yeah, in Montana, we have record investments in education. I've kicked dark money out of our elections. We've expanded health care. I do that by trying to build relationships with those Republican legislators, but I don't rely on those relationships alone. Meaning I spend a lot of time out in communities talking to people whose lives are too busy or frantic to care about politics so that they'll put pressure on their elected officials. There was an earlier question, I watched part of it, Senator, Booty, or Senator Booker um, talked about the filibuster. Yeah, I, I think I'd blow up the filibuster if I could, because I think it is one of these things where, boy, 
it causes nothing more than the status quo and inaction, and we can't afford status quo and inaction when it comes to climate. Somebody said, well, just imagine what Trump would have done in the last first two years. He would have taken away everybody's health care coverage. Well, the Republican Party has tried 70 times now to repeal coverage for pre-existing conditions already, so at least this would be a clear choice along the way. And I think that I'm not so naive, and it's never happened in Montana, like we don't all grab hands and sing, you know, we are the world and all get along. <laughs> but you also have to believe that you can find commonality. Investing in infrastructure, which creates good jobs and actually will preserve your communities and preserve our planet. There ought to be some commonality there. Addressing the possibilities for agriculture, even though production ag more often than not votes Republican, they do want to be conservationists. There ought to be those opportunities for commonality. And if you don't walk in believing that's the case, and I think I'm the only one that's actually done that, well, then what are we going to give you all for this next generation? What kind of government, but better than that, what kind of planet or what kind of actually functioning system that's going to address the challenges that you have? And I guess I'll say last, too, that I think one of the challenges that we have now, and that's why we have to look at overall both campaign finance reform and kicking dark money out, is people only think in two-year increments anymore. Elected officials don't think more than two-year increments. And if we're going to make the sustainable change that we need to, we have to figure out ways so elected officials are thinking more than just in two years of the next election cycle, but what we're going to do for your kids. Hi, um, my name is Haley Houck. I'm a senior here in the college, majoring in biology and minoring in women's and gender studies. Um, so increasing temperatures have a large effect on agricultural production as every one degree increase in global temperature leads to a 10% decrease in agricultural production. Um, this effect is especially detrimental in developing countries and leads to increased global food insecurity, especially for women and children in these countries. So if you're elected, how are you going to tackle increasing world hunger in the face of global warming? And you know, one of the things that- And that'll be an easy one to solve, go there, on out. There was, a, yeah, there was a, uh, a scientist who left the government recently because he wasn't able to publish his work on, uh, on climate. And, and one of the things he's studying is about how climate change is reducing the nutrition in, in yeah. certain crops. So the same acreage, and, and we're probably gonna have less acreage because of global warming, um, the same acreage is producing less nutrition uh, per acre. So this is going to be a very serious issue. Well, it's a significant issue both in our country and beyond, right? We have 5% of the population, the U.S. does. Yet, like if Montanans had to eat every bit of wheat that we produce, every living Montanan would have to eat 40 loaves of bread a day, right? So we actually not only feed our country, but we feed the world. And as you talk about global agricultural practices, that's actually the sustainability the economic sustainability for families as well. And I think the same best practices that we need to be implementing in agriculture in our country, we ought to be working with developing countries and other countries to protect the same because both from a nutrition perspective and the crops that you're going to be losing along the way, um, that obligation is there for their own economic sustainability. You know, we are now, and you wouldn't think of this as an example, though Montana is the number one state for chickpeas and lentils, right? Who would love, think that you make chickpeas. more hummus out of Montana than any other state in the country? But part of that was then producers saying, how can I actually do better by my soil and start rotating crops for different markets along the way? So we've always led this country in so many different ways. And we have to lead in the science that can be exportable to developing countries as well. And hopefully we'll do the thing so we're not going up another one and a half degrees Celsius so that these folks will still be able to plant in the same things along the way. I did not know about the chickpeas and lentils. That's true. You like Montana that yeah. much more. Montana. No, it, it is. It's interesting. The, yeah. Interesting. But, but that's also, and that's only in the last decade or right. so. But it also shows um, the opportunity, too, of as we start right. looking at different rotation crops, which right. are actually better for 
the soil. Right. Or if you look at, if we're willing to incentivize a no-till farming, well, it's going to be a carbon sink. It's going to be capturing right. that carbon along the way. And that's where I think that we have to and look it's, at it. It's, it's, it's good business. It's actually doing well. No, that's right. Uh, it, so it's, it's not, again, it gets us out of the language of sacrifice and giving things up and getting, get us, gets us into the language of prosperity and opportunity. Yeah, and that's, I think, for long-term change, that's what we have to do. I mean, as your thing say, it is a crisis. And we can talk about it as a crisis, meaning that you need to make immediate change. Mm -hmm. But if we're not also talking about it as an opportunity, I mean, look at just uh, wind as an example, as prices for wind have gone down. Right. Uh, the changes that have occurred. You look at, there's probably more coal plants shut down in the first two and a half years under Trump than there was in eight years Correct. under Obama. Right. In part, that was markets that drive right. that right. as For well as consumer Trump said about it, We're just not, we're no, not that's buying right. more coal. That's right. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lucy Stebbins, and I'm a senior here at Georgetown majoring in government and environmental studies. Um, you said that Montana is full of outdoorsmen and that there are a lot of beautiful places we want to protect. How would you go about preserving these places in Montana and around the country for generations to come? And how would you gather bipartisan support to protect America's public lands? Well, first of all, that, and that's what we've been able to, so the question, right, is public lands. How do we actually preserve them and protect them for that next generation, right? And I'd written an op-ed a while ago and I asked the president to go see what makes America really great. Like spend a night outdoors. See the stars, see the monuments that we're shrinking that are the first time we've ever done something like this. And I think this is also an area where it's not just public lands, but it can engage with climate overall to get more and more people wanting to take meaningful and active change. I say that there are three great equalizers, at least in the West. It's public education. It's public participation in a representative democracy. We're all equal on election day and our vote matters more than the corporations. And it's public lands because we all own them equally and we can utilize them equally. And from that perspective, I think that first of all, under Bullock administration, I'd undo the monument rollbacks and there wouldn't be transfers of federal lands because once you sell off those federal lands, ultimately what they're gonna go to is starter castles, right? It's a privatization. And there's been for a long time the Republican Party has said, well, let's just transfer all those federal lands to the states because we're good stewards. You're absolutely right we're good stewards at the state level. But just even the bar tab from firefighting mm -hmm. could end up making it completely unsustainable and those lands would be transferred. So I think that you really do have to, and that's another reason why I've said, even in my first week on the federal lands, I want to have my agriculture department, which covers all the forests, and BLM and Interior to come together and say, let's look at preserving these lands and using them as a carbon capturer, not just a carbon emitter, uh -huh. and have that goal and say, you tell me how we are going to be net zero emissions by 2030. And a greater level too, that that's an interesting thing that really struck me in Montana is that preserving those public lands has been one thing that we've been able to Partisan boundaries go away. It's a, this is because a if you're a fly fisher, you're a bait fisherman. Yeah, there's no you're Republican a who, skier, who, who gets no mobile or giving away public land. I mean, this is one of the great things in American history that we set aside national public land. Right? There's all sorts of countries that don't do that. But it's part of the Republican National right. Party platform. I don't get like we why should, this becomes. Partisan. I don't get it either. And and I also think that that's how that for some folks. You know, that I'd said earlier, it's hard to care about the end of the world when you can't make it to the end of the month. And I think that we have to think about that along the way. But for people that might not always think of themselves as conservationists, the ability to both have these public lands yeah. and then they know what their experiences are on that makes us all that much might more be more impactful than thinking about the end of the world thinking about the great world we've got and being able to sleep under those stars you being able to fish in that water being able to drink the water no that's right without fear that you're going right. to be poisoned be able to 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 boat in that water because it's not too low i mean that might be a great motivator i've never understood why we are being why the tail is being wagged by the corporate interest dog on public land no i that think that's right got to be obvious yeah
That's the lowest hanging fruit of all, I think. I think that's right. Governor, this has been a great conversation. Unfortunately, we're out of time, Shoot. but we do have a, we have a few more candidates, so uh, okay. stick around. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Allie. Everybody, Governor Steve Thanks Bullock so much. of Montana. Thanks. And I will be back in 10 minutes with uh, Mayor Pete uh, for our next session, so stick around yeah. for that. We can leave that there. Yeah, leave that there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, really